Ah, yes, Putin's a, a real leader. He's not a beta. He's a real alpha. He basically says, fuck that leftist, progressive, consensus-based, pro-democracy crap. It's time to have a real leader. The very thing I've seen Republicans talk about wanting for well over a decade. The right, the alt-right, and many others who are not on the left except for the inaccurate label they give themselves, have been wanting a right-wing alpha as president for a long time, or more so, they've wanted a right-wing dictator. And so comes Trump, who gets support from Putin. Lovely. I mean, who cares if Putin has a terrible human rights record? Who cares if Putin is a dictator? Who cares if he wants to cram one way of life down the Russian people's throats? Hey, that's patriotism. That's nationalism. He's a real patriot. Something we've moved away from in this country, and we need to force people to be nationalistic again. That's how you make America great again, by shaming people unless they're mindlessly patriotic and nationalistic. Putin's an alpha male leader, a real leader, a man's man, a leader who recognizes real leaders like Trump. Because totalitarianism is great when it comes from the right, and it's the worst thing possible when it comes from the left, because you know, cabbage. And so now we see front page stories on the Inquirer at the checkout stand when getting groceries that read exactly the same as what you find on Breitbart. I saw a ridiculous pro-Trump story in the Inquirer that might as well have come from Milo Yiannopoulos. You see, Russia didn't need to tamper with the elections directly, and so they didn't. They just had to put out some media narratives about the greatness of Putin, and narratives about the United States giving into social justice and communistic ideologies, because I guess McCarthy was right, or some other crap like that. Never mind the fact that there have always been crazy people protesting this or that at colleges. That's kind of what colleges are socially all about. They're about testing out new ideas. But because we now have technology of smartphones and tiny cameras, the internet, and home-brewed propaganda at our fingertips with things like YouTube, we can demonize everyone who brings forth any narratives that have even the most remote similarity to the people protesting at colleges. You know, those crazy people at colleges who normally wouldn't have had a voice except in their ridiculous protests that everyone usually would have forgotten about a year or two later. But now we can't forget about those things like we normally could because there are people who are there and ready to protest the protesters because the status quo is worth defending at all costs. At literally all costs. You see, we can look to Anita Sarkeesian as an example of someone who would never have gotten known had it not have been for so many people bringing such extreme attention to her. You know, the whole ridiculous outrage culture because someone on the internet has a viewpoint that you don't like? I mean, really, how many people who continually rail against Anita Sarkeesian even know who Andrea Dworkin is? How about Valerie Solanas? Robin Morgan? Linda Gordon? T. Grace Atkinson? Susan Brownmiller? Sheila Jeffries, Sally Miller Gearhart, David Angier, how about Barbara Jordan, Jermaine Greer? No? None of these people ring a bell? They have shoved forth some truly horrible things, but you don't know about them? But yet you know everything there is to know about Lacey Green, Francesca Ramsey, Anita Sarkeesian, Rebecca Watson, and in some cases even Laughing Witch. Well, how does that work? Well, it's because these people got famous because they were put in the spotlight and put in the spotlight and put in the spotlight and put in the spotlight by people who hate them, making Anita Sarkeesian be considered within the top 100 most influential people, according to Time magazine. She certainly couldn't have done that on her own. It took an extreme increase in outrage culture for that to happen. And sometimes I question what prompted such outrage culture. But, you know, Anita, Lacey, Francesca, and all the others that people constantly harp about are not even that extreme. But, you know, they're on YouTube, they're on social media, so we have to speak against them as if their views are particularly significant, as if they're what it means to be for social justice, they're supposedly what it means to be a feminist, they're supposedly what it means to support Black Lives Matter, even if there are people who are much worse than them. And even if the majority of people who are for actual social justice and the majority of people who consider themselves feminist and support Black Lives Matter are reasonable people who happen to occasionally use some of the same terminology as the people you hate. But you know, as long as we don't head towards that leftist, fascist, socialist, communist, bad words to describe anything remotely left-wing, 
We'll all be just fine even if we're not, because traditionalism, blind patriotism, and nationalism are more important than human rights, more important than stopping human suffering, more important than feeding the poor, more important than housing the homeless, and more important than trying to make life better for everyone, because you're supposed to be patriotic and nationalistic about a country that doesn't care about you, otherwise you're a communistic special snowflake cuck who believes in a totalitarian government or something like that. Because again, totalitarianism is only bad when the left does it. A leader with dictatorial tendencies is great when the right does it because cabbage.